everyone, I'm Karina Gantis, your host for Behind the Pen. I am award-winning author of 14 books, podcaster, YouTuber. I have my radio show, Author Assist, and I also run Author Assist, which helps the market and promote independent authors. Today, my guest is Linwood Jackson. I think I've got that right. Welcome to the show, Linwood. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And yes, definitely Linwood Jackson uh, Jr. You said it correctly. That's the first thing I need to ask you about your name. It's so unusual for a first <laughs> name. Where does it come from? Where does it originate from? I have absolutely no idea. But everywhere I go, somebody says there's a Linwood's pizza around the street or there's a Linwood street. There's a Linwood Boulevard. There's Linwood this, Linwood that. I have no idea where the name comes from. My, wow, um, it's very it's very unusual, but it's it's good to have an unusual name. It makes you stand out. <laughs> yeah, I hear that too. They say your name sounds so distinguished. When I see you, just to read your name, who knows what you look like? <laughs> but it sounds so strong. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know. I no, really serious. Know. They were they were <laughs> right on the money there. I tell you, Linwood Linwood Jackson. Who is Linwood? Who is he? So let's find out who you are. Um. As you know, Behind the Pen is a show which uh, chat, where I chat with people that work behind a pen. It could be illustrator, uh, artist, um, author, writer, screenplay, actor, a musician, editor. So, uh, Linwood, who are you? I am, I'll say, it. this is going to sound weird coming from me because I've never said this before, I'm an artist. Wonderful. Gonna embrace We're all that. artists. We are. We are all artists. And, and what is your art? What is it you major in? I like to write poetry. Wonderful. Um, my writing, I just published a book of poetry maybe last year, 2020. Congratulations. But my main, debut my main novel. Eh? Yeah, yeah. I, lo oh, I love I love poetry. I love oh, lovely. I love just the the art of it. Uh, the symmetry, finding symmetry when there is no symmetry within yourself through poetry. My, but my main work is focused on research and philosophy. So I, oh. I write mostly about the philosophy that's within the Bible, you know, as opposed to traditional religious thought. I write about the, the very intricate concept that the Bible teaches, which, is, which revolves around love. And not necessarily the romantic love that we're used to or that, you know, is forced on us from a Western point of view. It's the definition of love from the Eastern philosophical mind. So my books, they center around that and in my poetry. I, I get that into my poetry. And I even have um, a fiction novel that I'm hoping to publish very soon. I wrote it in 2011 when I was uh, 21. Now it's like 10 years later and I went back to it in... One of my done friends that. was. I've done yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> when it's the right time, it's the right time. Yeah, it feels it feels right. And so I've got the twenty-one-year-old mind in the story, but then the thirty-year-old me is is editing it and is is in collaboration with um, other editors on it. And so um, you know, it's it's a frame, a frame of thought that's developed and grown. So that's that, what that's me. what genre is your fiction going to be? It's fantasy, but it's young adult. Oh, right. Why a fantasy? Exactly what I write. Uh, <laughs> I write in all different genres, but I, I do have a um, duology of uh, young, and, young adult fantasy. So who inspired you to write the fantasy? I know who inspired me, but I like asking my uh, authors who inspired you. Um, I would say me, in a sense, uh, because the book is framed around... Greek mythology, Greek and Roman oh, mythology. You yeah, know so in Greece now, huh? <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's so. I couldn't believe it. You, I, yeah, I saw you were in Greece. And I couldn't believe it. It's um, Greek and Roman mythology, and I'm manipulating the characters. For example, the main character, his his, his name is Azazel. So I've got a lot of Jewish mythology, Greek mythology, and Roman mythology in this book, and I'm manipulating the characters to form a story, a story that, um, in a sense, tells my life in in a weird way. And yet, the life of an imaginary character. So Azazel, he's he's um, the son of Lucifer and the mother of Metis, uh, Zeus, uh, Zeus's wife. Wow! And yeah, it's a, and it's it's such a conflict because it wasn't like planned. Zeus 
Lucifer transformed himself into Zeus. And and that's how that happened. It's mm -hmm. like a, a form of a, a battle move. And Zeus found out, threw the child into the cosmos. The child just hung out in the cosmos. And then heaven took him. Like so here you have, yeah, so you have, here you have a product uh, that wasn't wanted. Heaven took him. He's growing up. He doesn't want to be in heaven. He doesn't want to be in hell. He doesn't want to be in Olympus. So he's now trying to figure out who he is and where he wants to be. It's like half and half, like Percy Jackson, half a god and half human. Yeah. But unwanted by the the father, who, of course, is really Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting. Wow. I mean, I'd say where do you get your idea from? But um, did you do a lot of research on Greek and uh uh, mythology and Roman mythology or did you already know most of it I knew and I didn't know when I went through it I didn't I didn't um I did research as I was going along so some of the names in there and some of the characters I did the research on but the story in and of itself is originally just just my imagination imagination yep. I, the, thing, yeah. the thing about especially with fantasy is that anything is believable anything you make up is believable because it's fantasy. You've created a whole new world, new characters, new names, um, new magic, if there's any magic, new creatures or dragons or whatever's in. in um, it's believable because you've lived within that world in your mind for 10 years while it's been put aside. Like my book was, the fantasy one, that was the one that was put aside for 10 years. Um, so we were exactly the same like that um, but uh, we have to when we're writing we have to even though we've we've made this uh, world we have to make it realistic and believable for our reader even That's though nice, yeah. for us it's alive these characters exist we hear them they tell us you know where to go and what path they need to go on next and we listen to them we love the voices when they start talking um, but we need to uh, make the book realistic so that what we're seeing in our mind playing off like a movie, the reader is also seeing. And of course, that's a lot to do with show, don't tell, which my editor just keeps on nagging at me about <laughs> years ago. But now, now I've got it. But uh, I had a hard time with that show, don't tell. I love telling. Um, so the thing is that if you're going into a young adult fantasy, which is fine, but you're also going into mythology, uh, philosophy, and like you said, you, you're basing the, the story off yourself, even though it's fantasy, you've still got to keep it light and easy to read because it's for young adults, even though... 100% will be adults that will read the book because young most adults read young adult books more than young adults do. Did you know that? That's a fact, I, that is. I came across that. Yeah. And, little, and as you're speaking, the one thing that's, that, that I like to stand by when I do write any sort of poetry or any sort of anything like that is what makes a fantasy or a fiction right is the fact that it brings realism into it. It brings an element of reality into it. It doesn't it doesn't get away from reality. It plunges into reality um, critically and creatively. So Correct. like you, when, I, when I do go about my writing, I wrote this in 2011 and I, haven't, I didn't touch it at all. So my life changed. My entire philosophy changed. I'm no longer the Greek Roman mythology person, but I still have it within me, the, the fascination and in, in, in how it's just interesting. And the culture back then, I love Roman culture. Mm -hmm. I love the culture of Greece, Alexander the Great, always, the history, um, the, the, the art, Achilles, oh, man, the art, everything. So now being, you know, I just turned 31, having these experiences and having um, the books that I've written before, re-editing this book, I left the same playfulness of my 21-year-old self in it. Good. And so you see the, you see the, there's, there's scenes of childhood, the childhood of the main character. You see the, him growing up in the adolescence. You see everything uh, to the point where you're just as confused as him because well, the book begins with him having his memory wiped out. He has no memory 
of his past. So we're, tr we're journeying along with this character who has no memory. So no we're trying to get the memory. Yeah, it's been taken away from him and we, we understand how by the end of the book. But and so it's I try to keep that you, element of realism. I was gonna I, I was gonna say yeah. with with the with the reader, do you allow the reader to know who the child is while he's trying to yes. or do you just have him oh you do? Because yes. I, I think it'd be fantastic to have him as someone who's had his memory wiped and the reader doesn't know why, and the reader doesn't know who he is. And so while he's traveling to figure out this, the reader is is going along that journey with them that's yes. just uh, one way I, I would have uh, one way you could have gone but um, if you told them from the beginning that the child was uh, from someone who looked like Zeus who was actually Lucifer oh, that wasn't then... not in the beginning at all no at the beginning good <laughs> not at the beginning at all that's that's the twist because that's that's the whole essence is I want the reader to be that character, whether you're male or whether you're female and you're reading it, you have an element of this person within you. Have you have to feel that emotion they're going yeah. through. Yeah. And, and that's, that's why there's so many elements that are important that I saved to the middle to the end of the book. Yeah, there we go. That's good. That's good. Artist? Artist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, when you're an artist, you're not just a writer. I mean, you're you've not. got that... You've got that talent, but there's always something else. So is it for you? I mean, poetry, writing, it's the same thing, okay? So is it for you music? Is it for you art? Is it um, dancing? <laughs> it could be. Uh, painting? What's your other artistic talent? I do write music, but I'm not so into it at as I should just because of the, the marketing and all of the, the appearances and the, the editing and everything that goes into, into books. But I do write music. Process. I do have two songs on Spotify. Yeah, I, I knew it. See, <laughs> see, I knew it. I'm so, a singer. I'm a singer myself. I used to be singer. Oh, man. So singing and writing, they were my two artistic talents. A little bit of drawing now and again when I feel like it. But I've had poetry published. And yet I'm not a poet and I would never call myself a poet because I don't have the passion that you have. I mm. couldn't sit down and read a poem or sit down and, and go through a poetry book. It just doesn't interest me. And when I write poetry, I have to be in the right frame of mind for it. So it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's uh, strange. It's more, I think um, poetry for me is more prose it's more poetic writing. I would still say that you're you're a poet because just because you you may not, for example, get angry every six hours doesn't mean you're not human. <laughs> so, like, just because you know you may not, you know, be in the mood or the moment to write poetry every now and then doesn't make you a poet. I think you're a poet. I think you haven't just, read any just, my poems yet. <laughs> just oh no, oh man, that's a scary thought then. Should I retract? <laughs> <laughs> they, I mean, some of them are, are, are um, rhyming ones. And some of them are just, uh, like I said, prose. Just um, being outside. One of them was I was outside on my balcony and I could hear the buzzing of the electric wires from outside. And I could hear the owl hooting. And I saw this beautiful sunset. And then I heard the rats above the balcony with their little feet. And it was just the atmosphere. It was almost electrifying atmosphere of standing there and listening and feeling everything that was happening around. And that was one of my little poems, just describing what was, what was happening while I was just standing there on the balcony it's amazing what can inspire you you know you could be out shopping one day and suddenly something comes into your head I mean when I first started writing I used to carry a dictaphone around with me everywhere and as soon as that idea or that scene came out or that speech came out out came the dictaphone I don't care <laughs> if I was in a coffee shop or a supermarket 
out it came. I recorded it, got strange looks around, but at least I got that out on my tape. So when I got back home, I was able to write it down. I never went to sleep without a pen and pad right beside the bed. And if I'd wake up with an idea, I would start writing. When you're in the zone, you don't ignore it because that's Go. when the magic happens. Yep. That's when it all comes out. Did you find when you picked up the book again that you quickly got into the zone or did it take a while for you to, to get back into the, the, the book and writing? It, it didn't um, take long. The, there was a couple of elements that I had to change in it just due to my, my present knowledge of, the, of religion and of philosophy. So those elements that I had to change, I had to reframe them. And I'm glad that I did. You know, because I'll just give a, an example. Uh, there's a creation scene in there. So to just talking about how the world started, how everything started, and how, how the, the philosophy of, of being human started. And, you know, I want to say mythos. And how everything else just came with it. Originally, it was called, you know, Trinity created it. But, you know coming a bit of more knowledge of what I have now about religion and about the philosophy behind all of that, I had to change, change it completely to the point where now there were seven uh, beings that created um, wow. everything. That's going to yeah. be an eye opener for the reader because we and all have yeah. our, you know, we all have our ideas and what we've been taught through uh, church or, yeah, or the yeah. Bible or from other yeah. people. We all have our ideas of how uh, the world was created and so to hear something totally different, different. From, from someone else, um, it's like when I first read the Da Vinci Code, oh my God, my eyes opened, <laughs> the, I was shocked, I was stunned, I ran straight to the picture of the Last Supper that I'd actually done a tapestry of, and it was in my kitchen, and I went straight there, and I looked straight at her, and I went, oh it's a woman and it just blew my mind whether it, it's correct whether or not the book blew my mind because they he told me and everyone something that no one knew and whether it was it was correct or not it was shocking and it's I think the wheels if, you, turning. It's if the you wheels can turning. you know if you can have you can do that to your reader, shock them through yeah. your book, then you, you've got them hooked and they're going to go right through to the last page. And then you'll get a lovely five-star review <laughs> and a great rating and, and what have you. How is uh, your, you, you said you published your poetry book last year. How has that been received? Oh, ridiculously fantastic. I've, I've done a couple poetry shows and the responses after them whether it's uh, me doing a live reading or me answering questions on poetry, the response has been excellent and especially from women. The book is about, um, it's a love, a love book, of course, um, defining the definition of love, but the two main characters, the, uh, the male is my heart, the female is my mind. So I'm playing off of these two images in a dialogue for, for a couple of set pages just to relay to the reader the conflict of being human, what it means to go through the process of understanding that you are more than what you think you are and that you are more than a traditional standard of what you think you are not. So, and dealing with the conflict of that pressure of accepting who you are for what you are and growing off of that. And so women, mm -hmm. read the, the responses from women that I got from that and the depiction of the female and, and everything, it, it was surprising and it made me happy that I did because I began writing this poetry nine years ago wow. and so each one of these poems are they're dedicated to my experience um, in personal and devotional reflection uh, coming into who I am outside of traditional religious thought both within and outside of society and being ind and independently owning my stance on on belief and on disbelief on confidence on assurance and on vision and how, that's what this book is how did this change in you happen i mean uh, you didn't wake up one one day and think ah 
Uh, or you you studied, you studied philosophy, you went to university, you read books. How did this come about? Your yeah. your thoughts of the difference between what we think of as religion and yeah. and and love and how you think of it, which is totally, totally different. But how did this come about with you? How did you know, did yeah. you teach yourself? I mean, yeah, it came about through um, I graduated college and the typical, you know, there's a there's a midlife crisis that people go through. But, you know, people in my age, we go through what's called a quarter life crisis. And the quarter life crisis is when you graduate college and you've gone through college just for the experience, for the sake of society and home life, telling you that you need to do it just for the purpose of the benefit of your life. And you're going through this experience. You're gaining absolutely nothing. You graduate. You realize you've learned nothing. You've done the so. experience for no reason. I'm, you know, this is just the mind of, of youth in, in today's modern age. And at that point, I felt upset with myself because I graduated with a degree, a BA in English, a minor in philosophy. Philosophy was, was partly me. But I graduated with that and I was disappointed in myself because I didn't let myself think about what I wanted. I let myself follow the scheme that had been given to me by society and by family to dictate the, the kind of person I should be or, or to dictate the kind of life that I should live. And so I wanted to do or to claim something that was mine and I picked up bodybuilding. And I you know, got to the point where I, I enjoyed exercising because I valued, I could claim it. I could claim the experience. I can claim the the growth of my body through through the pain I was feeling. And I could value the pain, as sick as this may be, as a form of punishment to myself for not accepting who I am and listening to others. So this gets me I can imagine just sitting on a mat with one of those whips and whipping your back because you're punishing <laughs> yourself, but you're doing it through weights. Um wow. And so, the, and Carry on. Yes, please. Yeah, that that landed me in the hospital because I was it got to the point where I was so defined through taking different supplements uh, and it got really to the point where I was going to be in a natural bodybuilding competition. I was in a gym one day and a bodybuilder uh, saw me, said, hey, you look defined. Take my card. I'm having a show. Get ready for it. So I spent the time getting ready for it. And it was one of those shows, you know, where you're all baby oiled up. You look good in the baby oil. You got the small, the small man bikini on one of those. And I was like, okay, so this may be something I can claim. I can claim this right now. But right before the competition, I ended up um, damaging an organ within my body. Oh, dear. And, and, I, knew, and I knew that I did because I had overdid the, the supplements I was taking. And it was in that, in the, as I was laying in the hospital, just wondering um, how come I didn't have the definition of love within myself to know that I should not be doing this to myself why didn't I have any any kind of sense or any kind of wisdom within myself innately despite the love I've gotten from family despite the love I've gotten from school despite you the love thought I've you were from... on you thought you were on the right path you were happy with doing uh, punishing yourself you were exactly. happy with doing the weights and you thought that was the path that you were supposed to take and when success. he handed the card over and you thought success. yes this is this is my fate this is yeah. my destiny but then it wasn't it, it you wasn't were never supposed to have gone that path and and that's what made me look at life in general so what I did after that was I had to make a decision uh, I can either decide to get up from this hospital bed and continue to slowly reuse the supplements I was doing to pursue the path I was going uh, because I felt it was something I could claim as myself. And keep in mind, at this time, I'm also in graduate school. I just got an MBA certificate on how to own, own a gym. So it was, you know, this was something that was in me mm. or I could realize that there is a need for something I'm lacking and I could get up and understand what's lacking, why it's lacking, how it became to lack in me, and I can develop the kind of character that I was born to be, and which is not easy or desirable, which is what I didn't want to do. But at the same time, I needed to do it, and the, the kind right of person thing. I am, 
I, I had to do it. And so after that, I got up, I left the hospital, I, I bought a journal. I wrote in the journal my philosophy on life and on cosmos, on being and on not being. And I learned a little bit something that's, that's different about you know, being human and being a young male. And that led me into wanting to understand if there were other minds that thought like me. So I looked at different philosophies, none of them meshed with me. I didn't wanna to go to religion because religion takes you away from yourself. So I didn't mm. want to go away from myself. I wanted to confront myself. Mm. And I wasn't really raised in a religious home, but my mother, you know, she tells me all the time when I was a baby, she read the book of Proverbs to me. So I always grew up with the sense of there is a, an eye out there that's, that, that's, that's there. And that eye is connected to you somehow. And so I, I picked up the Bible and I said, if you're real, be real. And I learned a mental and an inward and a physical diet through the Bible I applied it, I received physical health from it. And the wisdom that I gained, I wrote, and it became my first book, Perfecting and Reforming Personal Religion. This is when I realized that the philosophy within the Bible is not based on community knowledge, but it's based on a personal living inward experience. And that experience revolves around the definition of, of love, which is you know contrary to what secular or religious religion teaches. Uh, love being edification and loving being edifying to another or to self. And this is where my books and this movement now begin. Yes, I mean, people read the Bible and they read it for different reasons and they get what they, they want to yeah. get, take what they want to take from it. I had, um, when I left my middle school, we, we were given these little Gideon Bibles, tiny little mm. book. And we got them all signed from the teacher and the friends and that before we left school. And I've still got that. And that was so many years ago. And But it has passages of when you're upset, when you lack in faith, when you're depressed, when you feel jealous, to read these passages from the Bible. And so I've used that book all through my life for different reasons. Yeah. And I've read these passages and I've understood why they were meaningful to me at that time. And and you can, if you you read the Bible as as, as a book, as a history of what was supposed to have happened, or you take take it not literally, it's not literal. Yeah. Yeah. You you take what you, you're feeling from that passage that you've just read you understand why it's in the bible why it's going to help people why it's going to help you and that just changes just changes what the bible and and what religion is is supposed to what you've been told and taught yeah. and everyone has been uh, preached about it's not about that. It's never been yep. about that. Yeah, that's the point. You know, the I, I get deep. I've I've th these these books that I write. They're they're really based on the Bible's language and context. And so, what I really do now is, at this point in time, I speak about the the language, context, and philosophy that is within the Bible, and to the point where, you know, I can now I can now say that, and I can inform that. Though we read in a Western context, the book in and of itself is an Eastern philosophical mind. So you're correctly, you're very correct. Reading the Bible as a literal book in the Western context isn't, isn't going to, to fly. But reading the book in a literal Eastern philosophical context or in a devotional Eastern philosophical context, that's the right way that the Bible is supposed to be read. Mm. There's, there's realism underneath the layers of parables and psalms and exactly what, what, what appears to be story because at that point in time storytelling is Jew so, sorry storytelling is hebrew the hebrew author at that point in time wrote in stories to convey philosophical messages to understand the story is to understand the message there is so much hidden so yeah. much hidden and it's, and you either you either find it or you don't yeah um, but there is there is so much more to the Bible than it being just a, a book about a history of of uh, 
uh, Jesus and and God and yeah. it's 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 very I can say that from based on my research now there is no there is no book like it no. though written by individuals uh, similar to you and I meaning human the wisdom within it transcends any sort of wisdom that I've ever come across in any other book and that and that wisdom is what motivates me to keep writing about it. And that motivate in in that motivation, although for me, for for the need for love, still um, ten years later, still still going. I don't think it'll ever be fed, and I'm glad that I have the Bible to feed it. It's also for my audience because I get I I get more responses from my audience that say, "Hi, I've just come come out of my church and I've I came across one of your books and I bought it. Could you help me?" Or I just left one of my churches. I just came across you on the internet. Uh, could you please help me understand this, that, or the other? So the, my audience is turning out to be individuals that are understanding that there is something wrong, whether they, they're they atheists or whether they're evolutionists or whether they're Christians or whatever they, they would want to call themselves to be. At this point in time, they're realizing that there's something wrong and that they're seeing what I'm writing about is what they're thinking and in what they're feeling and in what mm. they're behaving as, but they just don't have it enough. So I'm very thankful uh, to be able to reach that audience and that I dig into how I do and that I could even branch out and extend that to poetry and to fiction. I yeah. think like that's, that's the challenging part is to. But I know <laughs> I, I've connected with you just talking for, for half an hour. I totally get where you're coming from. I understand completely what you're talking about. Nothing sounds foreign to me. It's like we're kindred spirits. We've, we've, it's, we've it's found, amazing. we have found what uh, people have been looking for, 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 for centuries, for, for whatever. Frequency, it's, it's character, it's desire. It's language, it's uh, invisible language, you know. What and I'm I'm glad that you that you have me because it's for what I do speak about. It's difficult in the religious realm and the secular realm uh, for for my for my kind of content because I've spoken to every single individual, whether they are considered to be an expert. Expert, I call somebody graduated with a you know, from seminary mm -hmm. or an individual that's that's lay sitting in the church or pew and listening, you know, the content, you know, at this point in time and in this age for reason and not necessarily, you know, scarring, disparaging religion or philosophy, but enlightening it. So showing that there is there is fraudulence, but at the same time, I can show why there is fraudulence. And what the I'm truth not, is. I'm not just going to be somebody that has a PhD and stands in front of an audience that tells you this is why you should be an atheist or this is uh, why there is exactly. no God. Because that 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 one-sided nature isn't enough for us as human beings. There needs to be there needs to be two. So I can show you I and this is what my books are about. It's the the understanding that you gain from the practical application of what you learn uh, within the Bible, as you were saying. Because the positive also, and the negative, isn't it? And also, as you were saying, there are people that, that that do tell me I don't I I can't go to church anymore when I when I sit there, I feel negative. When I sit there, the energy isn't right, and I will never tell anybody you need to you need to go because my response is always then don't. You have a brain, you are a human being, you you can think and you can feel. What's wrong with patiently exploring what you know to be true? Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Very enlightening. And um, I just, I, I understand where you're coming from. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised at myself that I actually understand where you're coming from. That's quite, quite, uh, I'm happy about that. Um, so, Linwood, where can people find your, your books and uh, find you on social media? You can find me on my website, Um L-I-N, 
W O O D Linwood Jackson and then J R Linwood Jackson Jr. dot com, or you can type my name into Google. I'll pop up my website, my Instagram, my Facebook, my YouTube, or Excellent. just go to YouTube and type my name in. I'll, I'm 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 there. I'm everywhere. And your your books are, are on Amazon everywhere. Are yep. they wide or just Amazon? Nope. You can find them on Barnes and Nobles. Brilliant. Uh, you could you could find them anywhere books are sold. Really. So just type them well, in and they'll be there. I really wish you all the best with your novel. I know you've, you've still got a lot of work to do on it. And I know you're eager to get that out. And uh, yes. it's a new new passageway, a new pathway for you. And uh, it's uh, something, if you started that 10 years ago, and you picked it up again, just like I did, then it's meant to be. And and so I, I really wish you all the best with that. And anything else that you write and... Uh, you you come up with uh, thank you so much for being a guest on behind the pen it's been such an honor chatting with you linwood thank you for having me